Hey, hello. Welcome to episode number 84 of the People We Love podcast. I am Adam Choi. Uh, what's up? If you're new here, what I do is interview people from all walks of life, often comedians and other artists about their lives and careers. It's a casual conversation, but I also ask everyone to highlight someone they love, someone who they admire, who influenced them, inspired them, or supported them. For more, check out peoplewelovepodcast.com, and the Instagram handle is at peoplewelovepodcast, and I'm on Instagram as well, at Adam Choi. And remember to tap subscribe or follow on whatever platform you listen to podcasts on. And five-star positive reviews on iTunes are greatly appreciated as well. So, today's guest is comedian Aaron Weaver. Born in Canada and raised in Michigan, Aaron started secretly rapping online as a teenager, but never gained the courage to perform his rhymes live. Raised by his loving and supportive and awesome single mom, Sandra, this very spiritual woman always encouraged Aaron to follow his heart. Unfortunately, Aaron's mom passed away several years ago, but Aaron did just that, gaining the courage to get on stage and perform his true calling, stand-up comedy. Let's just get into it. Here's Aaron Weaver. So it's good to see you today, Aaron Weaver. Thank you for uh, joining me on the Zoom here. I appreciate it. Of course. Thank you, Adam. Oh, how are you holding up during these uh, super, uh, super fun times this wonderful year? Oh, dude, it's, uh, it's a roller coaster. Um, <laughs> I'm uh, quarantining with a girlfriend, so that's been that's been interesting to share a uh, one bedroom with her, uh, slash share a brain. But like quarantining in a like we have a one bedroom. It's it's a big one bedroom, but like it's uh, a one bedroom apartment. So it's been crazy, man. It's like you're not just sharing an apartment; you're sharing each other's brain. You're just like there's another person that lives in your brain. And, uh, <laughs> You're, it's a, I've never heard anyone quite put it put it that way. I suppose. Yeah, that's literally what it is, and it's like you're sharing that space, uh, and it's that small. Uh, but I don't know. I, I I get jealous of my single friends, but I, I also see why they're jealous of me. So I can't complain. The grass is always greener. Is that is there something into that? There's something to that. Yeah, for sure. But you know what? It doesn't mean that your grass is not very green. No, no. You can have green grass on both sides. Yeah, I'm deep and profound. You didn't expect that. <laughs> Dude, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Talking about lawn care over here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, why don't, we, why don't we get into it and you can tell me about your life. And I, I did a little bit of, of research. I, I believe you're from Michigan. Is that correct? Whoa, yeah. Nice. Yeah, look at me. Yeah, I'm, I, I'm my staff. Okay. My, staff, my, my staff was on, my staff is, was on top of things today. Um, okay. No, but what do you? Well, I mean, I tend to ask people, what, you know, basically, what is your earliest memories? Like even pre kindergarten, if anything jumps out at you, um, oh, usually man. people remember miserable things for some reason, if anything. Um, you know, one of my first memories it was probably kindergarten, and I remember the teacher it was an older guy. He, he was in front of the class and he licked part of his hand and he had us lick on our hands. This sounds like it's going to be disgusting, but uh, <laughs> I promise you it wasn't gross. Uh, we all licked our hands and then blew on it. And he's like, I just remember him saying, that's the coldest thing on earth. And uh, I still believe that. What's the coldest thing on earth? Just the, the, the cold feeling of blowing on like your wet hand. Yeah. Yeah, I know. It's crazy. That guy got fired, huh? <laughs> yeah. After. Yeah, he did because he started. Kind of weirdo fire. is this spitting in with, with kids? Something seems weird. No, it was weird, but it's my one of my first memories. Yeah. What about uh, what about you know? Did you have uh, family siblings? What? Uh... I have a sister. Grew up with my sister and my mom, so straight up female situation. I got gotcha. you. Yeah. Um, what, what, yeah, go on. No, it was, uh, it was interesting. My dad was, uh, around, but they were divorced when I was really young. So that's why I'm a comedian. And yeah, everyone <laughs> takes their own path to it, I suppose. Well, it's a pretty common path, I think for a comedian. Let me, let me ask you something. Like I'm, be, I'm being serious about this question. You probably, you've been at comedy, I'm guessing quite a while and met tons and tons of comedians. What percentage of them would you describe as like stable? Like, like, oh. like, and like, you know, just 
grew up, had good family, whatever. And I guess it doesn't even have to be a good family. It doesn't matter their background, but like, who, who, what percentage seem to have together? Finan- man, financial aside, just like their lives. It seems like they have their life together. Uh, God. <laughs> I say zero funny ones. Wow. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Not zero, maybe like 1%. But there's like a lot of people who have it together and uh, they like do comedy, but they're like part time. You know, they're also a fucking real estate agent or a lawyer or something. They got it together more so. You need to have adversity to 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 find your huma- the humanity in your comedy and where you connect with people. Is there something like to that? Of course. Yeah. I mean, no one is going to like figure out what's so good about comedy unless they're going through a lot of pain at some point. Like, I don't know. Like the desire to get up in front of people, it comes from a lack of something. And so they're just trying to fill that lack. And if you don't have the lack, then you're not going to be fucking drawn to getting up on a stage in front of everybody. Less you know? likely, I suppose. What do you remember from like elementary school? Like what kind of kid were you? What were you into? Like sports, music, what uh, personality? What do you remember uh, from like that age? Elementary school? Let's see. I was... Uh, I don't know. I was into basketball. I was into gangster rap. I lived in a place where gangster rap shouldn't be popular, but I was very into it. Um, So basketball, rap. uh, I moved in the middle of elementary school to a different city. Um, Within Michigan. Yeah. Damn. How'd you know that? No, that was a question, but sure. I could have gone with it. (laughs) Okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> like, I'm confirming. Like, yeah. How much does this guy know? Um, <laughs> it was uh, uh, yeah, Oak Street. Oh no! Actually, <laughs> I did. That's where I lived in college. Oak Street. Get the fuck out. Okay, <laughs> something. Maybe I. I don't know. All right. Well, that's most like second most popular name. Most popular. I don't know what the most popular street name is, but go on about you. <laughs> I was asking you, uh, uh, you questions. Pine, Maple, Washington. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, uh, elementary school, it was chill, man. I don't know. There was a, there was a, a move, and that was hard to like move. Actually, twice in elementary school. What uh, grades? Because before Michigan, I lived in Canada. I was born in Canada, and uh, we moved to Michigan when I was in like first grade. And oh, then, so you did spend quite a, some time in Canada that you probably would remember. I mean, what do you rem- well, going going back a little bit? What do you remember from Canada other than the uh, teacher who licked his hand? <laughs> I mean, I guess. he's mostly that guy. <laughs> yeah, that's his feel. Your feelings about Canada are entirely, you know, based on that your experience with that teacher. Yeah. No, I country. have I have another memory, but it's just sad. I mean, I can tell you if you want, but it's it's really just sad. <laughs> Why are you putting me in a tough spot when you uh so I, I, that's totally up to up to up to you what you want to what you want to share but uh i don't care i just don't want to make your podcast sad um i mean i could always edit stuff out <laughs> potentially so it's so sad no it was just a really sad memory of my dad uh i i was hanging out with him for like the weekend their divorce i live with my mom he's driving me back to my mom's and uh, she opens the door all excited and I'm like crying. I want to go back and hang out with my dad because he's like, you know, stereotypical, the fun guy. My mom has to do all the discipline. Right. Yeah. So that's just a sad memory of me like running around in the courtyard trying to get back in my dad's car. And <laughs> I'm like, oh, God, my mom must have felt terrible. But uh, that's a memory. Yeah. Did you ever t- talk about this with this is something you never talk about with probably mom. With your mom or, or maybe I don't know. Uh, no, I don't think I did. I think I felt guilt about that one. So yeah, I'll up. just send her this part of the podcast. I'll oh, just clip out now, that. So it's fine. Oh, 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 oh yeah, I'm so, I'm so, <laughs> well, you never know. Technology, yeah, is, <laughs> technology is quite, quite advanced. You can research that. Where's your team? <laughs> I think you actually meant. Did I think you mentioned it or used the past tense early? Oh, the no, I did research it. I saw I saw the joke about the about the ashes. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. 
I'm, I'm, I, that's why I'm fucking tripping. I'm watching co- your comedy. I'm like, I'm like, oh, did he talk about his mom with me before we started recording? And then I'm like, oh no, the, 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 what was the joke about the ashes? You might as well tell that. Oh uh, God, that's still a new joke, you know, new since before the pandemic. But uh, how'd that go? Uh, she wanted her ashes spread in the lake. Uh, but I think one of the jokes was um, she wanted to be cremated so she could finally fit into her jeans, her like college jeans. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, the whole idea was that you, that you can get into places at once if you're smaller and you can fit in. A, it was easier to sneak into because they wanted to, you, they wanted a charge, I guess, to throw her, her into the uh, oh into yeah, the yeah body yeah. of water. So it's like, easier to also, move people around when they're in a jar form. Yeah, it was uh, the fact that. They actually charge you. They make you register to spread ashes in California in certain places. And she wanted to be spread in uh, Lake Tahoe, which is like a, on a regulated area, I guess. And we we're like, nah, fuck that. We're not going to register. Like, I don't know if anyone in your family close to you has died, but like 90% of death is paperwork. And like, you just do not want to do more paperwork. We're like, right. nah, this is over. We're done. So we snuck her in. And uh, turns out it's way easier to sneak people into places when they can fit into a jar. <laughs> yeah. The joke. And then, yeah, I just, I could have gotten to so many clubs when I was young if I could fit into a jar. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny, easy. yeah. <laughs> yeah, but that's, that's all new shit. I'm still working through that. But it's going to be dope one day. What, uh, what, when, did, when was this with your mom? When did she pass? That was 2014, so about five and a half years ago. Yeah, I'm sorry to I'm sorry to to hear all that and that you had to deal with all that. And it's all right, man. <laughs> that is, 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 I'm guessing it wasn't wasn't too much fun, and that she meant meant a lot to you, you know, uh, growing up. What do you, I mean? What do you remember about about her? Like, what jumps out at you about your mom, even as you know, looking back as a kid. Besides, uh, <laughs> it just, I'm sure you, you're making yourself look a certain way, but just by highlighting that one moment with your dad. But like, <laughs> yeah, so that was just more moment. to the story. Yeah. I mean, not that story. That was just a moment. I was just a dumb. Yeah, exactly. Story. Yeah. No. Uh, but uh, she was very spiritual before it was popular, before it was like, we're in LA and that's what everyone does. Yeah. Uh, this is in your act also, but I, I, go on. I, I remember you talking about this now. Jump. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, she's just very uh, woo woo. And we lived in Michigan where that shit was not happening at all. So, you know, she's woo woo. She was very health oriented, which in the nineties fucking health food was like bologna and blueberry muffins. Uh, I don't know if you were up on that, but <laughs> Like when I was in elementary school, my mom was healthy. Like, and that meant like bologna sandwich with wheat bread and uh, fucking like a muffin, like a blueberry sugar muffin, you know? Yeah. No, I, I, it's, yeah. I mean, you learn about, I feel like I've learned more about like health stuff over the years, but your mom, at least your mom was like trying. It seemed like she was almost like she would have fit better in, in LA or something like that. Where did she get this, this like, I guess, new agey or however you want to describe it, like spiritual health, you know, well, conscious stuff yeah, from? I, I where did it come know, from? I don't know exactly where she got it from, but I remember there was a time in my life, I guess it was when I was in elementary school and uh, she had gone through some sort of transformation. Like she was sort of like living through her wounds, you know, uh, up until that point, just sort of like bouncing around, getting married, getting divorced, uh, just sort of like wounded. And she went through some like big shift that I was too young to understand. But she told me later that it was about like forgiveness, forgiving people in her past. And uh, she said once she did that, she was just like flying on like this different level of vibration and uh she was just like she said all kinds of crazy shit she said she like levitated one night and you know i don't know if any of that's real but she was she's saying that she felt so much like buzzing energy that she felt like she actually lifted up uh she's like taking me to buddhist monasteries in michigan which is weird um at that time and uh 
Yeah, I don't know. She uh, she just said that there's some like big blocks that she had and uh, they, they lifted. And then I guess that was just like euphoric for a while. And that had turned her on to like read about what is, what is this state that I'm in? What is this? And that led her to spirituality. And uh, from from there on out, man, it was just like crystals and fucking breathing and meditation and all that shit. So it she, was a pretty. Did she? Con- yeah, that's nice. Did she constantly co- sort of experiment with different things and look for new new ideas, or was she kind of like in what like figure out a routine that worked for her or some combination? I don't know if you even would know the answer to something like that. Um, I think she was going through a lot of different things, like cycling through them. There wasn't a big routine situation. I mean, she was raising uh, two kids on her own, so I don't think she was doing like regimented meditation but right she's just constantly trying to or when she can figure out how to heal herself i mean is there anything that you recall that that would apply like universally to people as far as like even specifically like forgiving like how to forgive other people or how to forgive yourself or how to like how she went from the you know so-called you know wounded phase to you know, a feeling of enlightenment or whatever, euphoria, at least for, for her. Yeah. Any, just like, um, what, what can I do? What can we do? <laughs> well, she finally went to therapy, honestly. Talking like, to people. Talking. Yeah. Yeah. Not a podcast. <laughs> but, uh, oh, come on, man. Come on, man. <laughs> <laughs> talking to a professional. Uh, yeah. She went and saw a therapist for the first time and she like realized she had some wounds, like some deep, big ones that she never even knew. Like she completely right. pressed them. She didn't even know that these things had happened. Like, and she, uh, you know, she went to therapy and found that out. And uh, she uh, was guided by the therapist to forgive, you know, the people that she needed to forgive. Because like, you know, when you don't, you're just holding on. I mean, it's just hurting you, right? So it's the energy you're cons- you're, it consumes you. It's 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 bad. It's just bad. It's like a your soul is injured. So I don't know. It's just not good. On um, how you want to describe it, it's a weight. Yeah, it's just totally a weight. And I, honestly, man, I think that's kind of what our world is uh, lacking right now. I don't think oh, there's, yeah. any, there's no forgiveness. <laughs> like that's not a for for other people or and pe- or for themselves. Well, they go hand in hand. Yeah, if you're not right. doing it for other people, you're not doing it for yourself. Um, yeah, man. We like it's cancel culture. It's not forgiveness culture. Um, yeah, yeah. And uh, when I say that, I, I mean there's a lot of people that do shitty things, and we shouldn't just like say that's okay. But it's like we can say that's fucked up and also be like, yo, I understand you're fucked up. So I'm not going to make it worse. Uh, Hating on you. Um, Yeah. She, uh, she was guided to forgive and uh, it was just like such a massive, like deep shift for her to forgive the people that she was resenting that it just like, it was just like such a huge energy shift. It was like a slingshot. And it just shot. How old were you when you saw this all happening? Or maybe you didn't even see it, notice it at the time. I mean, it's hard not to notice, I guess, like, I'm guessing. It was hard to tell. I, I felt it a little bit as a kid. I was probably, probably like eight when it started. Yeah. I think the thing I noticed the most was that she wasn't dating people, which was cool. It was weird. You know, are your parents together? They are. Oh, man. That's nice. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) How it is. (laughs) Uh, But, yeah, uh, she wasn't seeking out people. So, you know, it's always weird for, you know, people with single parents when they bring home or date somebody new. It's like, uh, are you my dad now? Like, it's just weird when you're that young. So, I just remember it being awesome because she was single and she was just like doing stuff with us more and just uh wasn't seeking that validation outside of herself Um, yeah that's not something that you were able to articulate at that time i'm guessing but 
but you just noticed that she was spending more time and that was with you and that was cool and not bringing home strange guys or whatever not that yeah. they were strange but like to, to a to a young kid i mean sure it must, they must be stranger yeah she would she dated a few guys and uh you know it was strange uh to have them come in and out like it's just a, it's a weird phenomenon um but you know thanks to her forgiving people she she uh fixed that um as far as other spiritual stuff she did i mean i say this in my bit but she was just very all about following your heart just like everything was like follow your heart what's your heart tell you what, what what do you think your heart wants for you right now put put the question out to the universe and it's going to come back to you it might not be today it might not be tomorrow but it's going to come back to you just let it in, you know? And, uh, I think that's good advice, but you know, like I said in a bit, I just, I think (laughs) thinking that everything happens for a reason and that like, uh, following your heart a hundred percent of the time is the answer is kind of, kind of weird message to absorb because, uh, you know, you get into those spots where you're like, what the fuck is my heart saying? I have no idea. Oh no. I have to make a choice and I don't know what my heart's saying. <laughs> okay. Uh, now I have, I have a question. Did she take it to the extreme or did she with, you know, when she sort of talked about this, you know, following your heart stuff, or did she just say it so often to the point, like it's so etched in your memory. You're like, I'm going to take it to the extreme in my bits by, you know, by like, did she, did she use, did she use it in a way that was like, okay, mom, calm down. You can't like, I'm not going to follow my heart if I want, you know, a chicken sandwich or a burger today. Like I can just, you know, decide that question some other, you know what I mean? Like, did she take it to extreme or did you take it to the extreme in your bits? Well, I think there were times when she took it to this extreme, but I don't remember what those were. So in my bit, I make up an extreme. (laughs) Fair enough. Yeah. And I think, what did I say in the bit? It was, uh, Oh, hey mom, can I put this spoon in the microwave? And she'd be like, What's your heart tell you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I think it's good advice though. I, I think that's I think I mean No, no, you're right. It is it's good only advice. the first step. You have to take action and do other things if you wanna do whatever comes after that. But like the first step following your heart, I don't think that's so bad. It's not bad. It's not bad. Let me let me be clear. It's not bad, but yeah. like, that's you're the, heartless. When that's when that's the only like advice I have. See, that's why. It's oh, nice I see. Have, when it, it's nice to have a dad and a mom to like help balance the advice you get, because like you know, a dad is more in his head. He's more like logical thinking. Like, what yeah. do you actually need to do? And I'm I only got my mom, so I'm just like, yo. <laughs> I want a new, I want a better job, a better car and a better house. Like, uh, I'll just follow my heart. I'm not going to work for it. You know? Yeah. Let me tell you something. You could listen to all the gangster rap you want in elementary school. It's fine with me. I'm not going to get you in trouble. I see why I don't think it was a problem. For, <laughs> you know, I think they're like, all right, you know, this kid has had probably a rough enough time so far on this, you know, on this planet to some degree. <laughs> let him listen to gangster rap. It's fine with us. I was looking for my dad and Dr. Dre, man. I thought he was. Gonna- <laughs> <laughs> so you found, so you found role models in other places. Uh, yeah. I mean, they were around. Yeah. My dad was sort of there and my grandpa was there and Dr. Yeah. Dre and Snoop and. Sure. Uh, takes a, takes a village. <laughs> I know, yeah, exactly, man. It was a diverse village. That's uh, no, that's, that's, that's good. What do you remember from like middle school? Like you said you were into, you played, did you say you played sports when you were in elementary school and you were, uh, uh, well, I played soccer, soccer yeah. there throughout high school, middle school, elementary school, um, middle school, man, middle school is another crazy situation. I remember I had just, we had just moved again to a different place in Michigan and I'd finally met all I'd finally made friends like it took a while and I finally like found a crew and then right before middle school it was like seven of them and then right before middle school all seven of them moved and wait a minute they all moved or you moved they all moved wow. I I had just moved 
and met finally like made these friends and then going into middle school they all moved and so yeah that was that was a weird start to middle school <laughs> and uh you know it was it was awkward man it was an awkward time as i'm sure it was for everybody um i just remember like there was a couple small kids that were bullies and they were just they were just dicks they were just like push me they push other people and uh yeah just uh it's a weird memory i just remember them this kid alex and john and they were just push people um and i was bigger than them but i guess i was a little bitch at that point how do we go back and undo these things and go but can we go back and push them back be like yo i would right now i'll fucking go back and fuck those two kids up even Um, if i'm the even if i'm me that age like i'll I'll be i'll have the current me in my ear yeah that'd be tight yeah coaching (laughs) Nah, man, you just get them back by uh, constantly going up on stage. That's- yeah. <laughs> what about the whole forgiveness thing? But they haven't apologized for anything. Yeah. Well, I'm not saying I'm doing as well as her at forgiving. <laughs> like, it's hard. Oh, yeah. It's no, hard. That's, that, yeah, I was going to mention that earlier that it's not an easy thing to do if I didn't. Yeah. I uh, I wish I was... I wish I could do it easily every time, but it's, it's tough. I got an ego. You got an ego. Yeah. You know where those two kids are today? The, these two p- little pushers. It's probably whatever. not good. It's probably not good. I have no idea. Yeah. Look on Facebook, but, uh, I don't know. I don't think they're from very, uh, stable places. Yeah. I'm sorry to hear that too. Wow. The world is a little bit, is a little bit crazy. What about comedy or like music? Like, what were you into? Like, as far as like that stuff, watching, were you watching movies or cartoons or comic books? What kind of that cultural things were you into? Like, going up. Uh, middle school. Middle school yeah. yeah, middle school. I was. Uh, I oh, I had done a hard shift from hip hop, gangster rap into punk rock. So, man, I got deep into Green Day, deep into offspring this group rancid i was just like i'm a punk now i guess i just changed i dyed my hair purple and i was like this is me uh so that was uh that's what i was into musically um as far as what was i watching i think i was watching like baywatch just like getting horny over pamela anderson and mccarthy and shit i suppose you're not the only person to to do that at that uh at that age, at that time, you're no, from the '90s too. Or you're, you're like you're like me from the '90s in that sense. Yeah, a lot of boners from 13 year olds back then with Baywatch. Yeah, I suppose so. <laughs> yeah. Wait, when did you grow? Up? How old are you? I'm 30. I'm born in 38. I'm born in 82. Okay, so I was born in the end of '83. So yeah. We're yeah. Both. Yeah. Um. Baywatch, singled out. I would watch anything Jenny McCarthy was in. Um, just thought she was so hot. She was. I love hot- how most people. Yeah, I was gonna say I love how most people come on here and they're like, I watched SNL. Every, everyone. No, I'm. I'm not judging that. Of course, it's like uh-huh. you know, it's not a surprise, but it's what everyone talks about. Like, <laughs> I feel like you're like, nah, I fucking watched Baywatch and uh-huh. singled out. And not that other people didn't watch. They didn't watch those two, but everyone met. Those are the first things people, other people tend to mention. Comedy wasn't on your horizon. No, no, I didn't watch much comedy. I've never watched a whole lot of comedy, uh, but I was watching In Living Color back then. That was great. Jim Carrey, yeah. James Bros. Um, but no, nah, man, I, I don't watch much comedy now. I don't watch, I didn't watch it in high school much. There was, there's just one phase I went through in college where I watched a lot and that led me into comedy. And yeah. W- this was when did you say college? Oh, that guy was in college. Well, what did, well tell me more about, I guess, high school and like, what did you think you would be doing? Oh. Where were you going with your life? Where were you, I guess, into Were you, pl- I guess, thinking about going to college, you ended up going to college. It sounds like, where were you going to study? Like where, where were you at? Uh, yeah, dude, high school, I had no idea. I had no idea. I just knew math and science sucked. I didn't like them or I sucked at them. Um, 
I don't, I, I really was very confused about what to do. And then I went to college, uh, at a local school, like a local community college for a year and a half. And I started taking creative writing classes and that just, that felt good. Um, so I was doing that and then I transferred. Oh, I guess this is a big thing that we could talk about. Uh, around 16, I think I started uh, my career as an online rapper. Uh, this is complete- at 16, you said? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is like completely in the shadows. Like nobody knows the real me. Like I'm on, I'm just like online. Anonymous? You're anonymous. Well, yeah, under a different name, my rap name, which I'm not going to tell you, so don't ask. <laughs> right. <laughs> Only my girlfriend knows. Uh, wow. But it's embarrassing. It's an embarrassing name. So, uh, but, um, and there's still stuff online with it. So I, I don't, I'm not trying to have people listen to that. Uh, but yeah, 16, I started rapping. I don't, I just, uh, how did it start? I started going on like message boards, rap message boards, because I got really back into hip hop and just like underground hip hop this time. And, uh, I was going on message boards and then I, I met people and then you, we get on like aim and start key styling was the, uh, was the lingo at the time. It's like a sure. freestyle. You're typing into aim. I follow. Yeah. Yeah. So that was fun. I, I was like best friends with this dude from New York. I thought it was so cool. I was just in like this small shitty town in Michigan. And I was like hanging out with this dude, this fucking real rapper from New York. And it, it felt legit. And then uh, slowly started getting more technology. Started like you could buy a mic and plug it in your, your computer. And you could buy like a program to make beats and edit stuff together. So I started making like a bunch of songs and started making, I started like battle rapping people online out loud. And uh, it was fun. And uh, oh yeah. So the reason I started talking about this is because uh, when I transferred colleges, I uh, met up, I ended up living with a, a guy I met online, another rapper who lived like two and a half hours away at a school that I was thinking about going to. So I went to that school and I moved in with this rapper that I'd never met. We just like met in a parking lot one day <laughs> and then we ended up living together. <laughs> oh man. That's so this, this all started when you were 16 and, and you kind of like were at least part of this like sort of online underground rap community. Yeah. Up until you were 22 or something like that. And, and oh, yeah, continuing. Pretty, yeah. 22 probably. Yeah. 21, 22. But then you, I mean, then what about, what, where did that, st- that relationship with that community and that roommate, I guess, end up ultimately? Yeah. So the guy I met up with, he was like really doing it. He was, uh, he had like studio time. He knew producers. He would like get on stage once or twice. Like at that time when I met him, he had been on stage once or twice. And, uh, honestly, I, I think I chickened out, man. I was just, not ready to get on stage not ready to share myself in that way i mean i didn't tell anybody that i was doing it online it was a secret i would like hide my microphone if i heard a car coming down the driveway i just like shove it under the desk and pretend i was like i don't know doing yeah no i i i mean as someone who does creative things too i you know, can relate to that sort of like embarrassment, anxiety, whatever the case may be. What is it? What is it that you were most? Um, I, I don't know if the word insecure is the right word, but that you didn't want to share. Was it let you were the, the the lyrics, the beats? Like what? What was it like that you think would people would ridicule the most about what you? Oh, were it was my voice. That? Your voice. Uh, my voice. I was like, I was always trying to sound like more gravelly and like have a deeper voice and sound okay, like Okay, now I know what to listen for when I try to find this. <laughs> yeah, good luck. There's only a couple <laughs> other online rappers out there. Yeah. Uh, yeah, man, I just uh I felt like I sounded too nasally and too nerdy and too white and like all that shit. I just like yeah, but didn't Eminem inspire you to be like, I could do it too, or something like that? Man, if you're as good as Eminem, you can get away with having a dumb voice, but like, not not when you're not as good as him. Like, yeah. definitely not as good as Eminem. 
It's got to be you. Got to be you. And I wasn't ready to be me. So I was going to actually, I think you might have answered my next question because I was going to ask about like, you know, you said creative writing sort of we about to, you know, sort of continue on that path. That sounded like it was inspiring you in some way. And I was going to ask if you'd done any other creative writing before then, but it sounds like you've done creative rapping, but any other creative endeavors, you know, up until the point where you got sort of got into creative writing heavily in college? Uh, no, not before college. College, I was doing all kinds of creative writing, but uh, it was just rapping. Rapping was like the biggest thing. And honestly, it really informed my comedy when I found it later. Um, yeah, I mean, I really think without the rap, I wouldn't be a comedian. There's no doubt about that. Um, for several reasons. For one, you know, like I said, I, I was too scared to get up on stage and so when comedy came around, I was like equally terrified, but I was like, there's no way I'm not doing this after yeah, I did. you kind of have to, if you want yeah. to be a comedian. Yeah. Right. I was like, there's no way I'm going to pussy out on two things. Uh, I'm not, I have to do one of these things. And the reason I got into comedy in the first place was I really got into Mitch Hedberg in college. Like a lot of people did at that time. Uh, Mitch Hedberg. Sure. It was great. And I was actually put onto him by my New York rapping buddy. Uh, he was like, we were always going back and forth with punchlines for rap. And then he would start sending me these punchlines from Mitch Hedberg. And I was like, what the fuck? <laughs> rapper, dude. He's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> why, would, why would he send you that? It, for, as, a, as someone, you guys are working on rhymes and raps. Because, man, it's still about punchlines. It's both about punchlines. Like, the way, the, 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 in terms of uh, wittiness, uh, example of wittiness and where he takes the, uh, either the metaphor or the whatever. The, the, yeah, it's like... The word wordplay. Yeah, just the wordplay. Uh, you know how when you watch a battle rap and someone says a line, a punchline, and everyone's like, oh, shit. It was like that with Mitch Hedberg. Like, he had lines that were like, Oh shit, this motherfucker. No, he didn't. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. So I was really into him and uh Steven Wright. I was like, damn, these guys are writing punchlines like Eminem or Jay-Z. Like, this is the same shit. They're just not tethered to a rhyme. They don't have to be fucking hip. They can be nerdy. They can be whatever they want. Dude, I can see those influences in you. That's kind of like your your thing. I mean, like, do you ever describe yourself as that such? Obviously, like, I'm not, you, you, do, you probably preface, like, I know I'm not, like, trying to say I'm these guys, but, like, at least some kind of tone or style. Do you ever describe yourself to other people? Com like, uh, a, combina as a combination of those two guys ever? Uh, Stephen Wright and Mitch Hedberg? Yeah. Yeah, I've... Yeah, I've gotten compared to them a lot because, I mean, in the very beginning, man, in the first, like, two years, I sounded just like Mitch Hedberg. I was just, like, you know, carbon copy, just trying to be like that. Um, but I've gotten away from it more, but I still – Sure. You know, people still think I sound like him a little bit, which is fine with me. I'm, I'm fine with that because I think he's a great comic. Um, so, yeah, those those comparisons have happened, and it's cool with me. I just think I'm a little different. Uh, yeah, no, and the thing is, that you're, even if they're an influence on you, it's I never get the sense, or I don't think other people get the sense that you're not being your authentic self or anything like that. Right. You're no. being you, and there's just some crossover and inspiration in like the style yeah. or whatever. Yeah, and uh, you know the big difference. I think actually I heard Carlin say this in an interview once, and it I was like, oh shit, that's exactly what happened with me. He he said like his first, I don't know two, three, four, five years doing comedy, he was coming like from the front of his head. Like he was writing from the front of his brain. It was all like, you know, thinking about wordplay, thinking about how to craft this joke. And then he, he said he, he made this shift to go to the back of his head and just like sort of, you know, relax and ease into it and come from the heart and think about what you want to say more and, and then make that funny. And uh, that's what the shift that I felt I went through. Obviously it didn't culminate necessarily in becoming George Carlin, but, uh, it was, uh, it was a cool shift, man. And, uh, I just used to write strictly from my, my head, like just really trying to craft jokes out of nowhere, just 
thinking about words, tossing them over in my head and seeing if there's some way to like make that into a joke. Uh, but ever since I, sh- I changed it, it's more like, what do I feel strongly about? Let me try to make that funny. And that's, uh, it's a little less jokey and a little more like storytelling, but I, ca- I kind of like that shift. Yeah, it seems like you almost like strike a good balance between the storytelling and the personal aspect of what you do with the strong punchlines and the wittiness and the zaniness of the Mitch Hed- of the Mitch Hedbergs and the and the Stephen Wrights uh, for sure. Is there anything that's sort of? I mean, you kind of like almost. I feel like you. How long was it until you made when you met into comp? Were you into comedy uh, before you made that shift? Because I was going to ask you kind of like how you initially got started to comedy. Do you remember like your first open mic? Like you kind of covered what happened after that, I guess. But uh, what do you remember? Like initially when you first got started, what were the circumstances of you first getting on stage? Yeah. So I, I graduated college with a practical writing degree uh, instead of creative. I thought if I got a practical writing degree, I might be able to get a job. And then I, I moved to Chicago with a friend and uh, there were no jobs to be found. That was actually, I didn't even realize it at the time, but that was when like the, the housing market crashed and the stock market crashed and there was just... But my practical writing, but my practical writing. <laughs> you guys need me. I'll write about this crash. Um, yeah. So there was no jobs. I moved to Chicago and I couldn't find a job doing what I wanted. So I got a job uh as a waiter at the cheesecake factory and uh in chicago it's it's crazy it's like huge it's like fucking 400 people work there it's like this massive restaurant it's busy all the time and uh, i was working there and like i found out four of my coworkers were comedians and uh at that point i was already into mitch hedberg i was already like sort of shifting from writing rap lyrics to like yo this is like this could be like a stand-up joke i think and i was just sort of writing jokes in that way and so i i started at the cheesecake factory and i found out like three or four of these people were comics and i'm like yo you just do comedy i i thought you had to be like famous to do this and they're like no nah, man we you just go to this open mic sign up it's real easy so uh i ended up going to an open mic i signed up and uh i don't remember I, I i wasn't drinking but i fully blacked out like i do not know <laughs> what happened <laughs> so nervous um, <laughs> had all my jokes written down like on big in like big letters on a notepad just ready to pull it out and read off of it i made sure i announced it was my first time to the crowd so they'd like me yeah and, it worked, you know, the punchlines and the, the jokes, they, they got some laughs. Oh, that's good. And then the second time I did comedy, I didn't tell anyone that I was brand new and I just like ate shit. So, you know, it's a, it's a ride. Yeah, everyone's trying to, uh, when you do it the second time, it's always at through the 150th time, it's much harder. Uh, yeah. The first time, tend, people tend to have their, um, you know, people they know. For, it's the first time so the audience sometimes is you know more more supportive yeah exactly except for the guy I interviewed last week mike menendez i don't know if you know oh, him mike, yeah yeah he was like my first up in mike i didn't tell anyone that it was my first time i wanted to go in and have the most organic thing i um, wanted to have the m M&M eight mile experience and then he's like unfortunately it was at the opening scene <laughs> but he eats shit yeah yeah that makes sense but, yeah, tell people it's your first time. They'll be more supportive. If that's what you're, if that's what you want, do you still get stage fright or nervous or whatever the issue is? Yeah, yeah, I still do. Um, I still do. Not as bad, but it still happens. Uh, there was a time in my life when it went away, and I was just like, kind of on like this robot mode, where I was just, you know, I was doing well. I was like chilling, but. I felt nothing and it was weird and it scared me. And I was like, why, why do I feel nothing? Like I'm killing in front of a packed crowd. This should be like the most amazing feeling. But I think I just like uh, numbed out at that point. 
in my life. And that's when I started my whole journey of like going to therapy and like getting in touch with my emotions and shit. So now all that stuff's back. So the, the nerves are back, but now I have more experience. So it's like, yeah, I get really nervous sometimes, but I kind of know that barring some crazy circumstances, it's going to go pretty well. If you know, at least. Okay. That's, that's so, that's so interesting. That's all interesting stuff for sure. Is that when you sort that I'm guessing that's when you went through like the transformation, I suppose, from going to having material that was not that it wasn't funny, but it was maybe more impersonal and more punchline kind of stuff versus having more, uh, you know, vulnerability or putting more of yourself into your and storytelling into your, into your standup. Is that your whole thought with the whole therapy and going through a transformation or whatever? Yeah, that's a good point, actually. I've never put those two things together, but I I'm guess... Is that when it coincided, I'm guessing? Yeah, the very least? I mean, basically, yeah. I think I was getting uh, real sick of just repeating words. You know, like when you when you just like try to craft the joke and it's just words and you're just creating it out of thin air and it's just like a joke that you're not... It's like you got good at math. It's like you finally yeah. like conquered yeah. math in a sense. Yeah, I'm a fucking engineer. I'm just like good at math. I created this equation that I know is going to make you laugh and I'll memorize it by heart because it's not important to me like like emotionally. So I'm just going to memorize it and recite it. So yeah, that's what I was doing. And I think that was part of the reason it felt numb to it. I was going to ask, I, you know, I, I was going to think that the reason why maybe you you were getting numb to the audience, I, I what I initially thought was that you were maybe personally not challenging yourself in terms of like writing new stuff or, or the material was it, you were bored with your own material. But it it's, it sounds to me like you were writing new materials. So it wasn't that you were weren't writing new stuff. It's like this like where it was coming from it wasn't wasn't bringing you fulfillment. But yeah. you were writing new stuff at the time. Still, it sounds like. Yeah, I think I was I was writing new stuff still, but you know, at that it was like I don't know, God, when was that? Three to four years in when this the, was still all in Chicago, still still in Chicago, yeah. And uh, you know, at that time, I was like featuring at clubs, and uh, you know, Midwest there's tons of clubs, so you can really get your your chops down. So that's was, awesome that you it sounds like you you know you ascended for sure. Yeah, it was it was a nice ascension at first. That was that was great. Um, yeah, and I was like featuring at clubs, and it, it felt really good to do that. Uh, but yeah, when you're doing that, when people are paying to see you, you feel this pressure to do pretty well. You know, make sure they get their money's worth, and, and especially if the booker's watching, you want to make sure that happens. I don't want yet. I don't want this job, man. <laughs> I don't want this. I love you guys and I appreciate what you guys do, but I don't want this. <laughs> yeah, dude, don't do it. Please don't. <laughs> no, I'm not. I never, you know, I, I love, I love to watch though. And I love comedy, but uh, yeah. yeah, go on about that stuff though. Yeah. There's a lot of pressure, you know, cause sometimes the bookers would just be like right there with their arms crossed, checking you out. And it's like, am I going to do this new bit that I've never really tried out on a real audience or am I going to do this shit that I know works? So, you know, I do a lot of that stuff. Even, even though I was writing new material, I would still be doing a lot of that stuff at the shows that counted. So, you know, and in the Midwest, I was getting a lot of bookings because there's just way more stage time in clubs and alt shows in Chicago. There's just all kinds of stuff. So I was going up a lot. And uh, I was just repeating these fucking jokes that I knew worked because I wanted to keep ascending and like, you know, getting booked on more stuff. Yeah, it's a great feeling when you know something works and you're getting the laughs and you're killing and all that. It's, yeah, it's it's enticing to continue to do what's what, you know, what's working. What did your mom? I mean, I can I can imagine. But what did your mom think of you doing comedy? What was her reaction to it? And what was her reaction to your material? She was supportive. She was pretty supportive. She was just like, oh, yeah, you know, you're following your dreams. I'm happy you're doing this. Uh, you're following your heart. Following your heart, man. <laughs> exactly. Um, she would give me, like, suggestions that that were, like, just practical that I didn't like at all. She'd be like, well, have you ever thought about 
Oh, uh, you know, starting a business where you write like birthday cards, uh, making them funny, you know, <laughs> I'm like, no, what? No, I'm trying to get booked at fucking Zany's. Well, I'm not trying to write birthday mm-hmm. cards right now. <laughs> <laughs> My dad would say something like that, probably. Yeah, it's a parent- I read an article about something. Uh, yeah, exactly. But uh, yeah, she would have those like practical suggestions sometimes, but uh, overall supportive of me doing it. So that was cool. Uh, my dad, you know, my, I still talk to my dad and we talk like a couple times a year, maybe a little more, but, uh, he would say stuff like, Oh yeah, it's great. Uh, you, you ever think about becoming an engineer or, uh, you know, it's not hard to become an electrician uh, over here. <laughs> you know, this guy and that guy did it. Uh, you know, it's good money. Good money. Uh, <laughs> they're, they're, they're supportive they're, they're supportive or they're not telling you not to do it but they're always like okay so what's your backup plan kind of thing yeah, yeah exactly did your mom or dad ever see you perform or you know yeah yeah where did, my mom saw me in madison which was you know great because uh madison the comedy club there uh comedy on state is one of the best clubs that i've ever been to it's just it's just in Madison, Wisconsin. It's like, a, you know, it's a big, small town and there's enough people there to pack it out. There's like 300 people plus, you know, it's was a, it a college, college show, college town. So everyone's yeah. like, there's a reasonable amount of intelligence in the crowd. And uh, they're just also very nice and very excited to be at a show. And just, man, I've gone from LA to Madison. Like I did this uh, probably five years ago, I was just grinding it out in LA, just trying to get up where I can get up. And, you know, you get up on a great show, everyone tells you it's great. And then it's like a kind of a lackluster audience. And it's just like, this is not great. But, you know, it's just a struggle. It's like a competition to get stage time here. It's different than other places. But I remember going from LA and I had a weekend in Madison. And I just remember going up on that stage and like, telling my first joke and uh people just started laughing and i was ready to move on to the next part of it and they just kept laughing and i i was just like so confused i was like what what are you guys doing like (laughs) supposed to stop by now like (laughs) how high are they (laughs) it's probably not give a shit no they just that's like more normal than what you experience in la they're just like laughing they're just enjoying the fucking joke right and so yeah i was like i was like i almost want to cry right now it felt so good to like have that lift from the crowd instead of like constantly feeling like you're trying to lift the crowd up to you uh it was so nice so anyways my mom saw me there which was a great situation That's perfect yeah, yeah. that sounds like the perfect parents bring the parent to the to the show show yeah so that that was cool my dad uh, my dad and my like 30 family members saw me together, uh, m- like a couple years later in Canada at a shitty show, like a weird road show in Windsor, Ontario, which is right across the uh, bridge from Detroit. Um, and that was rough. My grandma, my grandpa, my dad, his wife my cousins they were all there and uh it was just like this grungy road show where it's just like drunk dudes in the front like blue collar type of situation where it's everyone before me is like crushing with like street jokes and just uh you know raunchy type of humor and i'm looking at my grandma and grandpa and i'm like yo dude i can't i'm not gonna do that right now so grandma and grandpa were into the raunchy humor no no i found out later they couldn't even really hear anything yeah (laughs) (laughs) i wish i knew that going in but uh i go up and i just uh you know i do my bits my more clean bits and uh they were just not hitting very hard my whole family's watching me for the first time and it it was just brutal man i was like oh no this is not what I want them to see right now. And no, uh, that after like eight minutes of that, I just was like, fuck it, dude. I'm doing sex jokes. I'm doing raunchy shit. And I, I did that and I got the crowd back for a little bit. But uh, 
at the risk of ruining my grandparents image but yeah they hear me they didn't hear you yeah <laughs> they couldn't hear yeah it was nice tell me more about the like the the part of your comedy career after you made sort of the self discoveries and you know the path to LA and kind of where where everything ended up ring you know where do we go from there yeah so let's see it's in chicago um i made that shift and i'm at the same time i'm also like diving into my emotions for the first time so i went from feeling nomad shows to feeling like like a f- open nerve you know like it was like i started going to therapy i started going to like this men's group thing which is sort of like therapy and uh just like i'm like i need to feel I, f- I know i'm like not feeling shit that's happening so i need to like let myself feel some stuff i need to figure out how to like feel these emotions so i was like diving into all that stuff and it was a lot and i was doing comedy so i was like getting it helped me get more uh, vulnerable on stage. So I was, I'd start telling more vulnerable things, you know, let my defenses down a lot more. But it also made me more anxious just because I was like touching those. Doing things. that. Yeah. Just yeah. And so, um, yeah, I was, that's, that was happening. And at the same time, I was also the Laugh Factory opened up in Chicago and it started getting really dope. It was actually pretty bad for like six months or a year. And then it all of a sudden it just started getting really dope and they started paying everyone. And, uh, it was just a nice, comfortable situation, uh, to be there. It's just like, I was almost paying my rent from comedy clubs and it, it felt great going on the road a lot. Um, but like three years earlier, I was like hell bent on moving to San Francisco. I was like, I, don't, I was like, it was just a very uh, idealistic place in my heart at that time. I was like, I gotta go to San Francisco. Uh, Jack Kerouac talks about it. Bob Dylan sings about it. Oh my God, gotta go there. That's where my, there's mountains, there's the ocean. And uh, yeah. my heart was telling me to go. And uh, my mind was like, scared i was like I don't, I don't, i'm not ready i don't know if i'm ready so i never pulled the trigger and uh then i met a girl and we started dating and we started dating for like two and a half years so i stayed in chicago dated this girl started doing all that emotional work uh was also getting more bookings which was cool and then uh eventually the relationship didn't work because it was just like we know I'm going like, we know I'm going to California. That's happening. Uh, I'm not sure if it's going to be San Francisco anymore, but I got to go. And so she didn't want to go. So it just didn't, it fell apart eventually after like two and a half years. And, uh, I was also like auditioning for JFL just for last festival in Montreal. Uh, I've been doing that for a few years and, uh, one of these times there was like industry in the audience and uh, they're like, yeah, man, we're from LA. You know, we, we really liked your set. We, you know, if you're ever out there, come on out and hit us up. And I was like, Oh shit, this is like real. Maybe this is something. And at the same time I had visited LA for the first time and I did the the laugh factory out there because in Chicago uh, I did it. And Jamie Masada, the owner of the laugh factory, he's like, Yo, man, we fucking, I love that. It's so quirky and weird. Like, come to LA. Uh, come do these shows, man. Like, you know, I'm going to have producers. I'm going to have directors. I'm going to have uh, agents and managers in the audience. We're going to give you a bunch of shows. You're going to be huge. And so I was like, oh, oh, shit. I'm about to be huge. What the fuck? <laughs> this is crazy. <laughs> so... I like hit up her, I hit up the booker for Hollywood Laugh Factory and they're like, oh yeah, just let us know. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll come back with some dates for you before you're, you're here. And it was like three days before I was about to like fly out there for the first time and they hadn't responded. They hadn't given me any dates and I was like, what, what the fuck? And uh, finally I, I responded and they finally gave me like two dates. One of them was like, 
Saturday at 7 p.m. in Hollywood, and the other one was on like Sunday or something or Monday. And uh, so I fly out there, I get to my show, and uh, I think this could be it. And I'm actually, I'm like super nervous because I'm expecting like possibly what Jamie told me was going to be there. Yeah. And I get there and it, there's none of that. It's uh, it's just Tim Allen. Tim Allen's doing a show and I'm doing five minutes after the host. Uh, Jamie wasn't there. There were no agents or managers. There was nobody there. And I was like, oh, geez, that feels bad. But uh, What about the crowd? Was there a crowd? I mean, if Tim Allen was there, were people there at that point? Yeah, so the, there was a crowd, but it was at this time in my shift where I hadn't figured out how to connect with like older people. Um, I was still like doing, I was still like leaning into this hip hop image that I had. And I was like trying to be cool and hip and just like uh, flowy and doing like young people jokes and like getting into my swag and just like having that be like part of the funniness of my act. Sure. And, uh, you know, doing a, actually had a, just all, for some reason I had a ton of jokes about uh, riding the bus in Chicago. There's just something I did every day. So I just thought about it a lot and I had a bunch of jokes, like my strongest jokes were about that. And I wanted to do my strongest jokes for this crowd. And it just, uh, <laughs> telling public transit jokes to old white people in Hollywood uh, believe it or not, <laughs> does not connect. <laughs> uh, so it didn't work out. I, I like the set was okay at best, and uh, yeah, it just it was not memorable in in any good way. Just did like five minutes, and Tim Allen did his thing. He was just like, bah, bah, and he was just fucking crushed. And I was like, what <laughs> the fuck? <laughs> Anything. And like all these people, the other like the host was talking to like this team of managers, and he's like, "Yeah, yeah, my Comedy Central special." And I was like, "What? What is this world where ever like this guy, this host is going to be on Comedy Central?" Like, I was just like in awe of LA. Um, it's a lot so, to take in. Yeah, so that happened. I go back to Chicago, and then you know I'm there for like three more months, and then I. Uh, start talking more to these managers and then I end up just saying, I, I don't know when the right time is. So I'm just going to pick now. And then I just, uh, I moved, uh, to Northern California for like a month because my mom lived up there and I just wanted to like land in California. And then, uh, yeah, I just went searching for some jobs in California, in, in LA on a, like a road trip and, uh, found one and I uh, took it. I didn't have an apartment and I just took the job and then I like had to work that job for like a couple of weeks without living anywhere or knowing anyone. So that was weird. I had to like stay in hostels and shit. Uh, and then I ended up moving in with this girl from Chicago. This is a, this is a long, weird story. I ended up moving in with like a girl that we were, I thought we were just hooking up for fun in Chicago, but she ended up moving to LA at the same time and we were both like flustered as hell and we're like let's just uh, <laughs> move in <laughs> so that's how I landed in LA <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's a cra crazy story but like I I don't know I feel like yeah I mean I, it's yeah it's just a it's just a good story right I mean you, you could almost like laugh I mean you like having those stories yeah I think you like I, having those stories it's absurd but you know it makes you who you are. It's part of part of who you are. Yeah, exactly. Gives you character. And what about the LA the LA journey? What are some of the highlights <laughs> or even low lights or struggles, trials and tribulations of uh of doing comedy in uh here in, in town? Well, let's see. When I first when moved it's happening. Here, yeah, when I first moved here, I was getting like a lot of stuff because I had like these high profile managers and I remember doing, I remember like, and this is probably says more about my self-esteem than them at the time, but they're all like, yeah, no, you're gonna, you're gonna have a Comedy Central half hour special soon. And I'm like, what, what, 
what do you mean? Like, you just met me. Like, how, what do you mean? And I like, this is like this weird thing to fall into where all of a sudden these people I'd never met after getting like very little recognition outside of Chicago, suddenly like hyping me up, like, yeah, no, you're the next big thing. And I was like, what? Like, this doesn't make sense. Like, well, you don't even know me. Like we haven't even started. Uh, so that, that was happening right when I first moved and they're like, yeah, yeah, no, no, write a, write a pilot, you know, do all these things, write a pilot, get a late night set together. So, you know, I, I started scraping together a late night set, started talking to some bookers from late night and they liked a lot of the stuff. And, uh, that was a weird process where it just, it didn't, it's, I, it's like, honestly still ongoing. I have no idea how that yeah. stuff actually comes to fruition but they like it but they want to see more and it's just been like a weird ongoing thing but uh yeah i was trying to write a pilot too and that was like i don't i don't know how to write a pilot <laughs> like <laughs> was just like what the fuck uh You're i don't not as bad any of this stuff <laughs> uh so i just started trying to write a pilot and then i like i worked really hard and i spent like you know a month or two just like going to the coffee shop every day after work and just like banging out this pilot about my life. Cause they told me to write about my life. And it was just about basically moving to LA and being a comic. Uh, and so I did that and then I, I gave them the pilot and they read it and they're like, Oh yeah, yeah this is good. This is good. But could you like just change uh, like everything? <laughs> <laughs> this was your, ma- your representation, your managers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're positive, but at the same time, the the underlying message was like, "Yeah, we I follow." We something else, yeah. So that was a journey, um, but you know, I was doing fun shows. Like when I first got here, I did like the Meltdown, which I don't know if you are familiar. Yeah, this on uh, Sunset Boulevard. Yeah, yeah, it was like the show for for as long as it existed. I think it was Kumail's show. And, uh, yeah, man, it was great. Did fun shows like that. Started meeting new people out here. Um, actually started getting into a basketball game, which is how I got a lot of my first like little writing side gigs and stuff, just playing basketball with, uh, different comedians and writers. So that was cool. Um, and then, uh, so yeah, I was here for a year and I was just like figuring it out. I was living with that girl and that ended up of course getting weird. Like, what are we doing? You want to date date and I don't. So what, what, what did we do? (laughs) This is not good. Uh, and then my mom got sick. And so I ended up moving to Northern California back to be with her. And, uh, she ended up passing as you know. And, uh, so I stayed there for like, six months just uh just felt like the right thing to do and it's like beautiful up where she was and i I really love it up there i wish i could live there and do comedy but it's just not possible uh so you know for me it was like an excuse to just be up there for a while so i was up there and then uh, eventually i was like fuck i gotta either move back move back to la stay here or go to new york so after racking my brain for a long time, I ended up coming back to LA and that's when I started do like, I started producing my own shows, do uh, comedians. You should know. I still do that. That's been running for like five years. That's, uh, that's at the improv or it was until the pandemic. So the improv in the comedy store. And then like two and a half years ago, I started doing a, a show called Full Moon Comedy, which is like a spiritual comedy show in a crystal shop. So it's like combining two of my favorite things for a show. So that's been really fun, man. Your uh, mom would love that. She would Your love. Mom it. would be so proud of you for for doing that. Well, how, how is how, what? I mean, can you even describe or explain what exactly that entails? Like, what goes on at a? I've seen comedy shows in many strange places already, just within you know in my life, but where, what goes on at a crystal shop comedy show? Yeah. So people get there, we're playing like Enya and like hippie shit. 
on the speakers. Uh, they sit down <clears throat> and then uh, I start, I, I record a guided meditation. That's how we start the show. I have like a funny guided meditation that just comes through the speakers. And then uh, our host, uh, Lindsay Adams, she usually like, starts the set and she like gives people crystals she gives comics crystals based off their set and then we have a couple comics i usually do a set and then we have a spiritual guest to close the show out so it could be like a psychic a medium a sound healer a cryptozoologist uh what else have we had meditator uh just all kinds of like whatever that sounds fun where where um is this show still going on or would it normally be would it still be going on if if things were yeah yeah it was the last show i did i think before everything shut down it's at a a really cool crystal shop called liberate hollywood in hollywood it's like right there in the center of it all and uh it's this big awesome crystal shop with like a nice stage and a nice pa it's perfect it's cool it's awesome well, I hope you're able to get back to uh, the stage and hope we're, uh, we'll all get back to some kind of sense of normalcy soon enough. Uh, we covered a lot. I definitely uh, appreciate your time and your stories and, and all the things that you shared. Um, what a journey, man. I did not expect, I guess I didn't have any expectations, but uh, <laughs> you never know what kind of, kind of stuff uh, you're going to, you know, what's, what someone's story is going to entail. Yeah, man. Well, I'm glad you had no expectations. I think <laughs> you know what I mean. <laughs> no, no, I just think that's what lets things flow, you know. Oh, for sure, for sure. Um, is there anything else you wanted to talk about or, or mention? Um, or uh, I mean, of course, uh, plug, promote as well. Uh, your social media and all that. I'll give you the floor. But if there's anything else you wanted to mention or talk about, uh, go for it. Um. No, nothing, nothing other than what I've said already. As far as plugs go, you can, yeah, follow me on Instagram at Weave Dreaming, TikTok even. I'm on fucking TikTok now. Uh, Twitter at Aaron Weaver with four A's. Um, and I'm going to be starting a, a spiritual comedy YouTube channel. So look out for that. It's going to be called Shamity. As in, like, shaman <laughs> comedy. So, I'm excited for that. Are you? Is it? Is it? A, is it a parody? Or are you? Is there any s- s- satirical aspect of it, or is it just actually combining spirituality and comedy? Well, there has to be some satiricalness to it. Like, it, I would think so. It's the only way to do it at some points. Like, but you know, there's there's like people out there that do satirical spiritual comedy, where they're just like strictly making fun of spirituality and the people in it. Um, but with mine and, and like with my meditations, which you can hear on my Instagram, I have, I think two of them uploaded to my Instagram uh, page. Uh, they're, they're funny and they are satirical at times, but I really genuinely want to like lift people up too and like get them to tap into themselves. So it's a little bit of both, man. I really want that's cool. Lift them and to get them tapped in, but I also want it to be funny and light. So, yeah. You try, it sounds cool. like you're finding you're finding your avenues for sure. And again, I appreciate your time. It's been a lot of fun. And uh, stay safe. Enjoy the rest of your your evening. It's getting it's getting late here on the West Coast. It is. All right, man. Well, thanks for having me. And have a good one yourself. Oh, for sure. You too, man. Talk soon. All right. Later. Later. So there you have it. My conversation with Aaron Weaver. I really appreciate how candid he was with me. That means a lot. But mostly that guy is just a funny dude. and just makes me laugh. And if anyone can find his secret raps on the internet, please DM me and send them my way. Anyway, for everything about this show, of course, head to peoplewelovepodcast.com. And I uh, think that's about all I got for today. Thank you, as always, for listening. You guys are awesome. And uh, let's talk soon. Peace.